Love them or hate them, video backgrounds certainly can add a unique appearance to your landing page or app, and in this tutorial I'm going to show you how you can create a web page that has a video background that is responsive and scales to fit the user's browser. But that's not all, we're also going to look at a few other things as well, like making sure the video isn't playing when not visible to the user, which will save precious processing resources, especially for mobile users, replacing the video background entirely on small mobile devices, and also compressing the video file as much as we can to save the user's bandwidth, something they'll thank you for when their data allowance is eaten up by your website design choices. So let's get started coding our responsive video background. We're going to need a few things for this project. The first thing is you'll need a video, of course. If you don't have one already, there are plenty of stock video sites where you can grab one for free. For this tutorial, we'll be using a drone shot of some mountains from pexels.com. The other thing you'll need is a screenshot of the video or an image which will be used to replace the video on mobile screen sizes. For our project, we can just take a frame from the video we have downloaded. A quick tip if you're on a Mac, use the screenshot tool to capture a selected window, and this should take a frame from the video without including all the controls. Finally, we're going to need a few web files for our project, so we'll create an empty CSS and JavaScript file along with an HTML document that has a boilerplate document structure, and once we've got those set up, let's ensure that we've got the CSS and JavaScript files linked in our HTML document. So the first thing we should do is get the video file actually on the page and playing, and once it's visible, we can work on setting it as a background for the rest of our page. Let's create a section in our HTML markup and add a standard HTML5 video tag with a reference to our downloaded video. Here we've set up a section which will display the background video and given it an ID of video background. For the actual video element itself, we've added a few attributes to the video tag, muted, autoplay and loop, and hopefully these are all fairly self-explanatory, but what we should end up with on our page now is a video element that has no sound and automatically plays looping forever. It's a good start, but if we want to place any content on top of this video, we'll need to send it to the background. We're going to apply some rules to our video tag in just a moment, but before we do that, let's add some styles to the section we just created. Here we've just removed the margin from the body element and set the font family for the document to be sans serif. The section for the video has been set to have a position of relative, which is important as we're going to be using an absolute position for our video element. Setting the section as a flex container just allows us to center the content that sits on top of the video background. This leaves us with setting up the rule for the video element, which is pretty simple. We set the video element to be absolutely positioned and then set it to cover the video background section. We should find at this point that the video is covering the entire browser window and should resize quite well if you change the viewport size. So we need to prove to everyone that this isn't just a video tag that we've made to fit the browser. We need to show that it is actually in the background and we can layer other content on top of it. So back in the HTML for the video background section, let's add a title for our page and a call to action button. We'll also add another section with some filler lorem ipsum text so we can scroll past our video background which will allow us to pause the video when it goes out of view. For the new div we've added inside the video background section, let's make sure its z-index is raised so it sits on top of the video background and also add some padding on the left and right. A few styles for the title text. And finally some simple styles for the button. Let's not forget to add a few styles for our additional info section too. What we should be left with now is a nice looking video background with some content sitting on top of it. That wasn't so hard, was it? So the video scales pretty well, but we might want to ensure that it maintains its aspect ratio on different browser sizes. We'll assume that we're going for a 16-9 aspect ratio, so let's add a couple of media queries to adjust the way the width and height of the video background scale. So when the viewport is wider than the 16-9 aspect ratio, we will set a fixed width of 100% of the browser window, and the height will increase or decrease depending on the browser height. And when the viewport is smaller than the 16-9 aspect ratio, the opposite happens, with the width adjusting to the size of the browser width. Our video background is looking pretty good now, but because the video itself is quite bright, the title text and button we've put on top of it get a bit lost. One thing we can do to make the other content stand out more is to darken the background video. A simple way to achieve this is to put another element on our page that has a dark or black background, but is semi-transparent. Let's add an element into our video background section and give it a class of overlay. Then we'll add some CSS for that class. We're pretty much doing the same thing as we did for the video element, just stretching an element across the page, but this time we're setting a black background with an opacity value of 0.8. This way we can see the video still playing in the background, but it's a lot darker, which means our white title and button really pop against it. 
You can of course get a bit creative with this, and one cool effect is to add a gradient background that fades into the next section to give a more seamless appearance. In some cases, we might not want to use the video on mobile and smaller devices, so what we could do is not display the video in these situations and replace it with a static image. We can do this easily with a media query, and this is where that screenshot we got of our video earlier on will come in handy. Let's write a rule to target smaller devices. We'll target browser viewport sizes with a maximum width of 400 pixels, and first of all set the overall font size of the document to be 70% of the original size, just to keep our title and button text in proportion to the page. Then we'll stop the video element from displaying by setting its display property to none, and in its place we'll use our screenshot of the video to be used as the background image. Now we should only see the static image being displayed when the viewport width is under 400 pixels. So hiding the video on a smaller screen is great, but on larger screens this won't happen and the video continues to play even once we've scrolled past it. This isn't much of a problem on desktops, but it would be good if we could stop the video from playing if we can't see it, as this should help to conserve power on mobile devices by reducing the amount of processing resources the browser is using. There is actually a funky bit of JavaScript we can use to easily do this. We'll create something called an intersection observer object, which will continue to check for us if the video element is in view. So let's head over to our JavaScript file. We first of all need to create a new intersection observer object, and then call its observe function passing in the element we want to watch out for, which in our case is our video element that is playing. But what about those arguments, callback, and options that we passed in when creating the object? So options is an object that has a few details about the things we want to observe. The root tells intersection observer what the parent element is. If we leave this as null, it will default to the main document element. The root margin property allows us to shrink the area of the object we're observing if we don't want to observe certain amounts of it. The threshold property determines how much of the element we're observing should be visible before a callback is triggered. In our case, we've got this set so at least 25% of the element must be visible. The callback function is called when an element comes into or goes out of view. It receives two arguments, entries, a list of intersection observer entry objects, which you can think of as basically all of the things that match the query selector we passed into the observe function, and an observer object, which is the instance of the intersection observer. We only need to worry about the first and only item in the entries array, as we only have one video element on the page, so we grab that and store it in the video observer local variable. Then we can check if that element is intersecting or not using the isIntersecting property, which will tell us whether the video element is in view. If it is in view, we play the video. If it's out of view, we pause it. Now when we scroll past the video background, you should see that it stops playing. Scrolling back up again restarts the video from where it left off. This is great for improving the performance of our video background, but there is another problem with the actual video itself. The video we downloaded from pexels.com is massive. It's 42 megabytes, which is enough to spark outrage from anyone who visits your site. Plus, depending on the user's hardware, the video might appear jerky as the browser tries to render the high quality video. So how can we reduce the file size of our background video? Well, we're going to need to compress it, which ultimately means losing some quality, but with our project we can actually get away with quite a low quality video, for reasons I'll explain shortly. We can compress video files using the FFmpeg tool, which you can get for free from ffmpeg.org. They have some guides on getting the tool installed on various different platforms, so we won't go into that now. Once we have FFmpeg installed, we can run a command in our project directory to compress our huge video file. The command basically takes the large input file we have and compresses it to a new file with a constant rate factor of 45. The constant rate factor, or CRF, determines the overall quality of the video output and the default value is 23. Lower CRF values are better. By increasing the CRF value to 45, we are significantly reducing the quality of the video, but also its file size. This might take a few minutes to run, depending on your computer specs. Three hours later. Check out the file size of the new video-small.mp4 file. You can see it's a fraction of what it was before and is much more data friendly for our use, but you will see that the quality of the video is absolutely terrible, so you might want to play around with the different CRF values to get the best trade-off between quality and file size. However, if you're using an overlay element to darken the image, you can actually get away with a pretty poor quality video as a background. You will see that the dark overlay element actually hides a lot of the imperfections of our low quality video, so we can get away with a much lower file size if we use this approach. 
So video backgrounds are a pretty cool addition to a web page, but they don't really offer much value to the end user. One thing that does offer a lot to a user is the careful use of an image slider, as it can be used to only display one product image at a time and not overwhelm the user. And if you're interested in learning how to make your own custom image slider, then check out this next tutorial where we'll be doing just that. But that's it for this tutorial. Thanks very much for watching.